All right, this morning, as we've already mentioned, we are going to have a baptism service, so I'm deviating away from our normal series in the book of Genesis. There's an outline in the back of your worship guide. If you'd like to use that to follow along, we'll be doing more of a topical message. Usually I have you open your Bibles up to a specific passage of Scripture. We read through it, try to look and explain it, but I'm going to be approaching the topic of baptism this morning, trying to answer the question of why we believe it's a critical thing. So I've entitled the message this morning, A Critical Condition, Why Baptism Matters. So in order to get us thinking through, why does baptism matter? Is it really an important, or is it kind of an optional thing, uh, or, or not really consequential? It's, it's if, you, if you really are serious about Christianity, that's what the serious people do. But if you just really want to make sure you're saved and going to heaven, eh, you can kind of take it or leave it either way. To help us get us thinking through some of these things this morning, I want to ask you the quest- two questions. Is it necessary... And is that the same question as, does it matter? Is it necessary? Does it matter? Is it necessary to have your driver's license to drive a car? I mean, if you really want to think about it, you say, well, pastor, if you're going to obey the law, yes, you need to have your driver's license. Okay, but can you step behind the wheel of a vehicle, sit down, and drive it down the road or your vehicle isn't going to work, or you're going to get thrown off the road if you don't have a driver's license. Is it theoretically possible? I I think it is. We've we've established. and In fact, I I remember when I was working with the immigrant community in my last one of my last pastorates over in Marshall, Minnesota, our church had the opportunity to network with a group of uh, immigrants from Burma and Myanmar. Uh, They were coming over from refugee camps in Thailand, really trying to adjust from their relatively primitive surroundings in these refugee camps out in the jungle where there's dirt roads, no vehicles, they don't even have running water. That's the kind of thing that's going on, okay? And so they get here, and you're trying to explain to them, I mean, among other things, I remember there was one time, uh, maybe I've told this story before, where the men in the church that we were getting the chance to connect to uh, were figuring out how to go hunting. Because out in the jungle, basically anything moves, you shoot it, and it's meat. Okay? It, it, they don't have a lot of things to choose from, so they're going out and getting whatever they can, foraging just to survive, just to feed their families. In the United States, things like hunting laws don't really compute with their minds. So one day, some of the men are going out, and they're also, their families are discovering social media. Uh, so the wife has social media. She's so proud of her husband because they've gone out in the woods, and she has her, her husband there with his kill, and he's holding up uh, the, his catch upside down by the legs. And I look, and I said, that's an owl. <laughs> and so my, my first call as your pastor is, number one, get that off of social media as quickly as possible. <laughs> Number two, don't ever do that again. <laughs> About the only thing worse is it could have been a bald eagle, you know? <laughs> and this was not good. But they didn't know. Was it possible? That, but was, it, that, was that something that mattered? Yes, it was. And so, when it came to driving, there was a lot of them who were figuring, you know, I know I need to get my driver's license, but in order to get ready for this, I need to practice. And so they would start practicing, which meant driving to work without a license or without insurance. Or sometimes they would get their learner's permit and say, well, that's enough. And then they would go driving off by themselves. And we had to kind of explain to them, that's not how it works in this country. Uh, And try to help them think through what was necessary and what really mattered. You can do this. There's nothing physically stopping you. But understand, the consequences, if you get caught, are going to be significant. Is it necessary to have a birth certificate in order to be born? Do you need that piece of paper? Well, you know, biology has been working for thousands of years, and they, they they could make babies without paper before, right? But... Is it really necessary? We've learned in our society that if you don't have 
that certification to clarify who you are, when you were born, what your status is in citizenship and identification. It's really difficult to do some of the things that you really need to do to function in our society. You say, well, I'm breathing, I exist. Well, that's not enough. We need to establish your identity. We need to establish who you say you are, what your ownership is, what your capabilities are. There's a lot that hinges on that piece of paper. Not just the fact that you have been born, but it signifies your identity. I've used this illustration before when we've talked about baptism. But most of us who are married have a piece of jewelry on our finger. Is it the ring that makes us married? Well, you say, well, I guess I got it on my wedding. That's usually when we, the spouse puts it on our finger. But is it the ring that makes you married? Like if I would magically turn this off, which I won't try to do today because it would take me a little bit of a long time. Um, but if I was to take this off, would that mean I was no longer married to Jennifer? No. At the same time, does it matter that if I'm going on a flight and I notice that there's a young, attractive lady who's going to be sitting down in the seat and I suddenly just kind of work to take my ring off, is that a significant statement? Does that matter? Would that matter to my wife if she knew that I did that? <laughs> yes, it would definitely matter. It wouldn't stop me from being married. It might stop me from breathing later on. <laughs> but it would matter significantly. It would be making a significant statement. So it might not be necessary for me to technically be married. What makes me married? It's the vow. It's the relationship that we have established before God, before witnesses, and in the sight of the government that we are connected. We have made pledges to each other. We have a covenant between us. This symbolizes that. This doesn't make that, but it is a representation of something that we have done, something that has already taken place. So why does baptism matter for the Christian? I'm going to give you some different things to think through, but first of all, we do this and we have three people from Calvary and one person from the Rochester Chinese Christian Church who will be following the Lord in baptism today. And they will be doing this because they believe that Jesus has commanded this. Scripture teaches this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus, just before he ascends back into heaven, says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And then, after they follow the teaching, after they come and follow me, what are they to do? What are you to do to them? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 will go on to say, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. So it's not just enough to give them the gospel. They're going to heaven. Now they're wet. Uh, we can just kind of let them go on their way. No, the church has a responsibility to teach them what God has commanded. What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ? But where does that begin? What is the initiation process that Jesus gives to us? It's to follow the Lord in baptism. It's to give Him obedience because Jesus has called us to follow Him. Luke 9, 23, these are the words of Jesus. If you have a red-letter Bible, you're going to see these words are in red. Jesus says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. This is not given as a condition, necessarily, that if you don't follow me, then you're not saved. But this is the normative expectation that he's given. If you are a believer, you are going to follow me. You are going to care about what I'm asking you to do. You're go it's going to matter to you what I want you to do, how I want you to live. In fact, Jesus will say in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. So he has that relationship with them. He cares for them. But my sheep will be identified this way. They follow me me. 
They listen. They care about the parameters that I have established for their life. They are, it's going to matter to them how they conduct themselves, where they are, even at a day like this. They're part of a church. It matters to them. They're going to make being with God's people a priority. They're, it matters that this is something that God wants us to do in regards to how our sexuality plays itself out. We're talking about marriage as an illustration. A lot of people view that as kind of an antiquated institution, not something that really matters today. Jesus' sheep hear his voice. And they follow him. They take into account, how does God want me to live? What are the choices that I should be making? Following Jesus should be a life-altering choice. It makes a difference in how you live. It makes a difference in the priorities. Not because if I don't do these things, I'm no longer saved, but because, just like if I was on that airplane, I would want to keep my ring on. I'd want to be careful about the kind of conversations I would have because, not because my wife might see me and she would be disappointed in me, but because I love her. I want to be faithful to her. I care more about my relationship with her than the thrill of trying to get somebody else's attention for a few moments. That's what covenant faithfulness should look like in a marriage. And it's no different than what we should understand our responsibility to Jesus is. We believe in him. We care about what he thinks. We want to reflect him to the world around us. So often we treat baptism in Christian circles as some kind of a rite of passage, some kind of a formal, incidental entitlement to verify our religious identification. Look at me, I'm a Christian now, I'm kind of growing up and taking the next step. But even to our candidates, I'm going to encourage you to think this way. It's not just a step that you do. I'm a teenager, I'm old enough, maybe I should take this next step. You should be understanding, I want to follow Jesus. I want everybody around me to know, I'm taking my faith seriously. I want to obey Him. It is, at the same time, not a condition of our salvation. I'm going to describe it more as a certification. It's a certification, not a condition. That's the next point on your outline. Baptism is not a requirement. Scripture is clear on that. The people that we see in Scripture are getting baptized uh, not to guarantee their relationship with Christ. We were going through a membership series this morning during the Sunday school hour that precedes this, and we state as a congregation the only condition for salvation we believe in what the Bible teaches is faith in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Paul tells the Philippian jailer in Acts 16.31. That's all that's necessary. And this is something that is true when the Bible teaches about baptism. Jesus says in Mark 16.16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Well, that kind of throws us off a little bit because it does seem like, wait a minute, belief and baptism guarantee salvation. You can't really have one without the other. Until we keep reading, we finish the phrase in the sentence. And what does it say? He who does not believe or is not baptized will be condemned. Is that what it says? No. It says, whoever does not believe is the one who knows condemnation. Baptism is there to certify, to give confirmation, a verification. This is what has already happened in my heart, and I'm acknowledging this to Jesus and to the world around me, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. That's important. But if you don't believe, it doesn't matter whether or not you got baptized. All that matters is that you have put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's the only condition that Scripture puts on it. Another place where it talks about this, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 21. Baptism now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God. Now, again, we might stop there and say, wait, baptism saves? That doesn't sound right. 
and yet he explains himself as we keep reading. What is baptism? It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. Not for life-changing, life-altering transformation. It's saving us in the fact that we have believed Jesus has asked us to follow him in baptism, and so in order to obey him, in order to fulfill the obligation that Jesus has asked us to do, we do this. We picture our identification with Jesus' death, burial, and as the verse says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We walk in a new life. This marks that we have believed, we are following, we are endeavoring to live like he would want us to live. Be a picture to put on display, letting our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. One of the best first initial things that you can do to show the world around you is to follow the Lord in baptism like we have here. Why? The people that have come here today all brought people with them who want to see, who want to watch, who want to commemorate this experience. Some of you might be here today, and you're getting the chance to hear, among other things, not just what the Bible says about baptism, but you're getting the chance to hear how necessary it is for you to believe that Jesus Christ died, not just for the sins of your relative who's getting baptized, your friend who's getting baptized, but that Jesus died so that you could have hope so that you could have forgiveness, so that you can know that when I pass from this life into the next, I don't have to worry if God thinks I was good enough or if he's going to see if all the bad things I did are outweighed by all the good things that I did. What the Bible teaches is that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus, will be saved. Why? Because Jesus died. He came to this earth as a human being. He lived a sinless life. He died the death that you deserved for your sin. And John 3.16, Jesus himself says that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, won't know condemnation, but will have everlasting life. They will know the new life that Jesus and Jesus Christ alone provides. Not because of anything you have done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Baptism says, I have believed. But you've already believed. It's what is a public confirmation of that. So, if we understand that Jesus commands it, baptism is simply an affirmation, a certification of what has already happened. Sometimes I like to use the phrase, it's the outward sign of the inward change that's already taken place. It is incumbent upon everyone who believes to make and establish that connection with Christ. You, friend, if you have not believed, you need to believe. But if you have believed and are wavering in some way, putting this off, this needs to be a challenge to you. Establish that public connection with Christ because baptism always is portrayed in scripture as doing that not just to Jesus but to the people of God for example the first time that we see New Testament church baptism being practiced is in Acts chapter 2 verse 41 and Luke records this those who received Peter's word so Peter's just preached a sermon on the day of Pentecost calling them to faith and repentance what do they do they believe, and those who received his word are baptized. And then what happens? There were added that day to the church, there in Jerusalem, about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So it wasn't just, oh, I'm a Christian now, I'm not going to hell, we'll go back to our normal life. No, there is a process of continued discipleship. I am baptized. This is who God has given to me as my spiritual influences, my spiritual leaders. They're going to help me mature and grow in my faith. God's given me those gifts, and I'm going to take advantage of them. I'm going to celebrate the ordinances, the breaking of bread. That means they're not only eating, sharing meals together, they're observing the Lord's Supper together. 
they're going through these things to commemorate their relationship with Jesus Christ, to grow in a community with others. This is something we need to do as well, to keep making and establishing that connection with Jesus and his people. And that begins, friend, by confessing your own need. So again, let's not get baptism in front. Baptism is the secondary. Is it necessary? No, does it matter? It does matter absolutely. But what is necessary? It's faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism tells everyone that you need what Jesus has supplied. Romans 6, verse 3, Paul says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, baptism there can be talking about a couple of different things. Baptized into Christ Jesus might mean the water baptism, but it can also mean the inclusion of the believer into the body of Christ, that we've been absorbed into something bigger than just the individual. We are now part of an entity known as the church, the universal church, the body of Christ. But how, again, is that signified? Because it is the ordinance, the ritual we're going through here of baptism. Verse 4, we were buried, therefore, with him. And this is definitely talking about the ordinance. By baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So when I'm in the tank, I typically say this. I might ask the question, you know, Joe, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and trusted in him? And they'll say, yes. Then I will say, then upon profession of your faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus commands in Matthew 28. Then we'll make this connection. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Corresponding with what Paul says here. That's what's happening. It is the death, burial, and resurrection that gives us hope. We are identifying that. I need that. Friend, you need that too. Baptism is a confession of our need, but it also, as we've talked about here this morning, it confirms our identity as Christians. It identifies you with something bigger than just the fact that you're avoiding hell. And again, sometimes that's what it can be. Salvation can be thought of in that way. Maybe baptism is like the double guarantee. Okay, I, I prayed the prayer, I got wet, I'm going to heaven, I don't need to worry about anything else. No, it's more than that. It's a significant relationship that you're entering into with Jesus and with his church. Ephesians 4, Paul says this in verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You say, well, pastor, what that, you know, it's a, we're part of the big universal church, right? Yes, but it's more than that too. Because we are united by the same gospel truth, whether it's Calvary Baptist Church, Calvary Evangelical Free, Christ Community, uh, like Pastor John prayed for, Cornerstone Baptist in Pine Island. Any church that is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ dying for your sins, rising again from the dead, so that you who believe will be forgiven and have atonement for your sins and the assurance of pardon from hell, peace with God, and eternity in heaven where there will be fullness of joy in the presence of God forever. It is that one baptism that gives that confirmation. Any church that you go to that's following the truth of Scripture is going to understand. It's about belief and then the confirmation of that belief. So the technical term we would use for what we do is credo-baptism. Baptism that follows and confirms one's faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, what we are doing today is not to verify that these people before they weren't going to heaven and now they are. That decision's already been made. But what we are doing, what they are communicating to you is the final point, the conclusion that we have for today's message. Baptism declares to the world what Christ has done for you. 
Baptism declares to the world what Christ has done for them. Take note and take the realization here as well, friend, that what he has done for them, he can do for you as well. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved.